so Wednesday, two days from today, is my spiritual birthday. My spiritual birthday, for those who don't know, is the anniversary of the day that I was born again. I was 26 and a half when that happened. It's my most celebrated day of the year that of all the days, that is the most significant day for me to celebrate because I not only have been born again, but I was delivered from just raging addictions and mental illness and I was in torment. So I belong to Jesus Christ now for 31 years, two days from now on Wednesday, February 16th. And before that day, I was lost in the darkest depression and mental torment, which resulted in multiple deadly addictions. And I came probably minutes from hell. And I'll explain that. And I'm passionate to share my story so others don't lose their will to live as I did, because that was when I started to die, was when I lost my will to live. And I had lost all hope of being saved and there's a reason for that. So I live to see the miraculous happen in desperate lives and I will spend forever expecting God to show up and flip the script over and over and over because my life is a miracle and God has given me faith for miracles and surrounded me with a team at Seven Bells who also believe in the supernatural and for the miraculous to happen. God knew of my life when he wrote it in Psalms 107, 17 to 22. It says, Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them, and he rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice, thank offerings, and tell of his works with songs of joy. So I've taken quite a few um, verbal, probably scoldings along the years for how fervent I am and how focused I am and how passionate I am. But I feel that if people would have lived in the sustained torment that I lived in, knowing that I was dying and that hell was where I was going forever, if they had the full impact of that for as long as I did, trying to avoid it and not finding any way to do that, they would understand why I don't have an off switch, why I just keep going with this message because I am so grateful. And I find my own testimony very amazing. I never get tired of telling it. And God has used it over and over and over to pull someone from the edge of death because I get called into quite a few situations where someone no longer wants to live. And I am passionate to respond to those. I feel privileged to be chosen by God and I cherish what he has done with the wreckage that I created with my life because I did that. I, I am grateful for every single thing that happened now because he uses it all even the worst things and i live every day desiring to give hope to someone who really needs to know that god can restore their life from the worst situations imaginable because that is my life um i i don't talk a lot about my years before my addiction because it's hard to understand even now um i know that my family did the best they could. My father had severe mental illness. We didn't know that at the time. Um, it was just really a chaotic home in, emotionally and hard to, hard to uh, find peace, hard to, um, it was just really a hard emotional place. Um, I had, I, I was probably born with anxiety. I've had um, prayer ministry many times and they said that I've just had anxiety from the beginning. Um, I also progressed to a lot of anger, rage. I had, I struggled with terrible abandonment issues, isolation. I still 
tend to lean that way. I'm very introverted, so that doesn't help. Social phobia, I have such a severe case of social phobia growing up that it's a wonder that I can even speak. Except that I'm so passionate about what I share, I would never speak to people because I have no desire to be social or the only way I was ever socially equipped was to be very intoxicated. That's the only way. I grew up in religion, so I did not know about the love of Christ. I knew a lot about God and a lot about judgment, but I did not know that I was accepted or loved by God or that there was any hope that I could be. We didn't go to church outside of our home. I don't fault my parents for that now. I know that they did what they felt was right, even though it was pretty cataclysmic to my emotional health. Um, when I was in high school, I ran away from home. This was not a common thing to do, but I was enraged and I didn't understand the rage. I felt like I was dangerous and I didn't know what that meant exactly. So I left and I basically um, couch hopped. I went from, you know, my best friend to my grandma. I went from place to place just staying at different places so that I didn't have to go back home because I was afraid of my emotions already by then. However, I stayed in high school and I graduated in the top 10%. I was National Honor Society. I was a State of Iowa Scholar. I was considered a success, but I was completely crazy in my emotions. So being smart isn't a benefit when you have no control of your emotions. And I had certainly offers to go to colleges, but I was, I was so unstable and I didn't even understand that. I had no, I, no way or no one to tell me how to stabilize. No one, back then it just wasn't something that you talked about. I was so damaged emotionally that I didn't know how to survive my own thoughts and my family there was addiction in my dad's side of the family and I remember him telling me often if you drink you're gonna end up like them referring to other members of the family that were having a really hard time and so I thought okay I'm never gonna drink because I sure don't want to end up like that because I had enough problems already so I had made many vows to be good I was never gonna drink do drugs smoke um, be sexually immoral I was going to do good things so that I didn't end up worse than I already was. Sadly, the summer after I graduated from high school, I broke all of those vows. I ended up having a drink that was a dessert drink and the impact of that drink was so marvelous that I knew immediately that everyone who warned me about drinking was a liar. That's what I knew. That for me, drinking fixed everything that was wrong with me. And so anybody who says, if you drink, you're going to get like them and go to jail, that is not the experience I had. So I never tell children or young people, don't drink because it'll make you this way, because that wasn't true. And it made me resent all the people who had lied to me about the impact of drinking. I was... Um, about to start college at that time and I did start college but I only lasted a few months because I was so, so out of control with my drinking that I fell out of college almost immediately. I ended up hospitalized um, almost dead from already the consequences of drinking and the impact on my health. So I that all happened within a few months and the next eight years of my life were an absolute one-time binge. I never stopped I drank excessively anything that there was to drink, and I ran with a pretty bad crowd. I really got into the clubs because they were loud and I needed something louder than my mind. I had severe eating disorders from the time I was almost, from the time I was 18, I battled severe eating disorders. I had terrible anxiety, I was OCD, and I was part of a very bad crowd almost everywhere I went. And I was often suicidal and I was hanging out in nightclubs almost every single night. I could not be alone. I could not be home. 
I had to be where there was a ton of people and it had to be very, very loud. I became addicted to rock and roll music and I could preach an entire sermon on the power of music in one's life. That's what the devil was created for was music and people need to know that what you listen to you will become and I became what I listened to and I worship the very ones whose purpose from the devil was to drag me to hell and that's what happened the music gets in you it influences your behavior it influences where you go it influences just about every decision you make and this resulted in behavior that caused me to be violently assaulted by an obsessive stalker when I was 24 years old. My life changed forever at that time. I was dressing in such a way and behaving in such a way. I draw attention to myself, but at the same time, I wanted to control the attention. I couldn't control the attention. And then that happened. At that point, I never wanted to live again. That was so terrible for me that I did not want to live after that. And I told this person that could just kill me because I didn't want to live. And I didn't want anyone touching me for many years following that incident. I was very hostile and withdrawn. I couldn't even stand touching myself. I was just so broken from that. And I did much more extensive use of alcohol in the privacy of my home because there's times I just could not be around people. I was so broken and damaged from that assault. And it's a complete wonder that I lived because of how much alcohol I could ingest. And many nights I was unconscious and I'm, I marvel that I lived because I was alone and I would drink myself unconscious and I know how much I could drink and someone should not be able to live through that. God kept me alive. At the age of 26, my life came to a physical end. I was very sick from eating disorders and way too much drinking. I, was, um, I wasn't one who ever threw up from, from using, but I had started to, um, I, was, I was hemorrhaging in some way and I, I wasn't sure why, but I was becoming very sick. I was also very cold, so I was dehydrating and I was very cold as a result. And so I couldn't keep warm and I was needing to sit in front of space heaters. I was just freezing all the time. And I was um, thin, but yet very swollen at the same time and very disturbing to look at. I was shaking violently. I was a odd color. People were very concerned that I was dying because of the color I was turning. And now having a lot of history and addiction, I kind of know the things that were wrong just because I'm used to seeing this trajectory. But at the time I had no idea what was happening to me, but now I kind of know what was happening. I was unable to function because of the shaking and the throwing up and I couldn't even keep water down at that point. Many um, who knew me knew I was not gonna live long. And just as many expected me to commit suicide because of the hopelessness that kept pouring from my mouth. I wasn't one who said I'm gonna commit suicide, but people feared that I would because of the way that I was behaving and the way I was talking and the way I was isolating. And some everywhere I go know how sick I felt because I meet people who know how sick, sick feels when you're that sick. And I knew I wasn't going to live much longer. My mental health was completely destroyed and I couldn't think right about anything. Nothing that happened in front of me, I couldn't tell anymore what was real and what wasn't. I did not know what was real anymore. I couldn't tell, I didn't actually know the reality of my own life. My paranoia was so severe at that point, I feel like in a few days, I'm not gonna be able to walk anymore. I start going to different churches trying to find hope because I know I'm going to hell. There's no doubt in my mind I'm going to hell. And trust me, I had prayed a sinner's prayer multiple times, but I knew I was going to hell. I knew that wasn't going to save me. I knew that praying a sinner's prayer did not equal born again. Everything in me told me that that did not work and I, I end up now knowing that was correct. But I go to these 12 churches during the day, so the pastors were there, 
And they all told me, all 12 of these pastors said to me, you need to go to detox. I'll come and visit you there. All of them said that, every one of them. That caused me to give up. The last hope I had, that was it right there. The last one that said to me, you go to detox, I'll come and see you, was the last hope I had. Because I knew there was no way I could get sober. There was no way I was going to be able to get sober. My mind would have, I, I couldn't handle it when I wasn't sober. So I gave up on church because I knew that I could no longer get to a place where God could help me according to 12 ministers. So I knew I was going to hell and I was just now going to endure what that looked like. God is amazing. My little sister experienced a miraculous salvation somewhere in this window. And she also had been living a life that was far from God. And it's hard to, she didn't have anyone really lead her to Christ. She just, God just kind of brought himself to her. And she was so changed that I couldn't even, I couldn't do anything but sit and stare at her because she came up to where I was. She was peaceful and she was sitting there looking like a decent human being. And that is really hard to understand when she had been as wild as me. She gave me one condition to being with her and that was that I, I just shut my mouth because she couldn't stand the profanity and all the hopelessness. She said it was just, she couldn't take it. Shut your mouth. I'll sit here with you, but stop talking. But she would talk to me about God and her new experience with him. And I would just sit and stare at her because I could not understand what she was saying to me, but I always just captivated by how is she like this? That's the thread of hope that I had was how did she get that? My mind was so destroyed, but I was just captivated by her stillness. I wasn't showing up for work. Two of my coworkers came and forced me to urgent care one day. The doctor, it was during flu season, and he just was looking at me shaking. I looked terrible. And he asked me, um, what was going on and I just said I was having a breakdown and he said he'd give me something for the stress but I had to return the next week so that he could check on me to make sure there wasn't more going on because they were very busy at that time and he gave me um, a prescription for Dilaudid which back then 30 some years ago that probably wasn't uncommon but it was the last thing that I needed he, I filled the prescription, and I already was a, a chronic amphetamine user, so it was a real bad situation anyway. Nothing was working by this point. I could barely function, and the next day, my sister came. I hadn't taken the pills because they, um, I didn't want, I wanted the amphetamines because I was trying to keep some kind of energy. The next day, my sister came and took me to meet her pastor, Pastors Lauren and Barb Molsness, they were pastoring the Assemblies of God Church in Albert Lee, Minnesota. Pastor Lauren feverishly explained something to me over and over. I don't know what he was saying. I was just staring at him. And I couldn't understand anything he was saying to me because I could no longer process English language as fast as people were talking. I had no ability. My brain could not keep up with it. So I finally told him that he was wasting his time because my mind couldn't follow what he was saying. And he said, Jesus Christ can cut right through that. And I heard that. That's the only thing I heard him say. And I still think on the power of those words because I heard that. It was like a bullet hit me in the head. I still think on those words because Jesus Christ can cut through anything. He can cut through a coma. He can cut through death. He can cut through anything. And I live under that belief that I don't care how hopeless you think this situation is you're bringing to me, Jesus Christ can cut right through that. And I believe that. And I am never one to give up on someone because everyone thinks they're too drunk, too high, too something. That happens so often. I'm not hindered by that because Jesus is not hindered by that. I never got sober. The pastor held my hand and prayed with me when I left, and I'm sure it was another sinner's prayer. I was in utter turmoil, and within 48 hours, I took the overdose of drugs and alcohol that should have sent me to hell. It was definitely more than enough. 
My only thought at that point was hell cannot be worse than what I'm experiencing, the greatest lie I've ever believed, and there were many. Hell is forever, and it is t so much worse than what I was experiencing, but my mind maxed out, and I could not imagine it being worse. I was driving away from where I was staying when I had overdosed so that I could be alone. I did not want anyone calling 911. So I had driven to get away from there. I didn't care where I went. I just knew I didn't want people around. I get pulled over by the police. I've been pulled over by the police many times, but that was the final time I was pulled over by the police. And I was taken to jail because I was very intoxicated and the police officer just kind of listened to me rant and I don't even know what I talked about for a long time. It said it was about two hours. And at that time they tested my blood alcohol, which came at uh, 0.245, but they also realized I had overdosed on pills. So after this long of time, I was, it's, a, it's just stunning I lived that long considering the pills that I had taken. They wanted me to go to the psych ward in a neighboring city, and they told me that um, they thought I was going to die that night and asked if I had family who could come pick me up and take me immediately to the hospital. My sister came and took me back to the same pastor and his wife. Instead of taking me to the hospital, she took me to the pastor and his wife, and the pastor's wife took me alone to her basement because she said that's where she would meet Jesus. The pastor himself took my sister because he did not know what was going to happen and he didn't want her watching because he felt that it was going to end up in a really, he felt it was going to be a real traumatic situation. I remember being draped over this woman's shoulder is all I remember. She told me a lot more later on about what was happening and it was far more gruesome than, it was not a good situation. She said she'd never seen anything that bad. So we're sitting on the floor and I'm over her shoulder and she starts wailing. I can hear her crying and wailing. That's it though, because I don't remember much of anything at that point. But her account was that she had never seen anything this bad, that she knew I was going to die if Jesus did not come and help immediately, that my sister had told her not to pray in the spirit because it would freak me out because I was involved in some bad stuff. So she prayed normally until she knew she couldn't do that. She started praying in the spirit because she said it required a miracle for me to, to live. I can still hear her voice in my head to this day. I can hear her wailing in my head, but I can also hear the words in my head that I heard that day. And it was come to me little girl over and over and over that I heard but yet her, I didn't figure this out at the time, but she was wailing and saying something in a different language because I can hear those words too. And I don't have any idea about praying in the spirit at that point, but I knew that the words I was hearing in the, in the words, it wasn't the same. But the words that I was hearing in my mind were what I gave into. That's what I... That's what I heard, and I was listening and hearing the pleading, come to me, little girl. I was nearly unconscious, but I was interpreting this woman's tongues. That is what's incredible. God is amazing. She asked me at that point to repeat after her, I renounce you, Satan. She said she asked me to do that twice. I don't remember any of that. From this point on, I don't remember anything. She said I went instantly limp, and she thought I had either died or she pictured in her mind the places in the Bible where Jesus would deliver a demoniac, or would deliver a, someone from a demon, and they would fall out as if they were dead. People would think they were dead. That's what she saw in her mind. So she chose to believe that, and she started cleaning. She said she just went upstairs and started cleaning and left me laying on the floor. She said, I couldn't even tell you were breathing. You were so still. Um, I had not been still since I was born. So... For me to be that still is, would be very concerning to me too. I would have thought I was dead. And she left me there until my sister came back and she woke me up. And at that point, when I woke up, I was a totally different person than I had ever been in my whole life. I was completely physically well. My entire body had been healed. 
I was very peaceful. I never went through any withdrawal. I was completely free of drug addiction, alcohol, even smoking cigarettes. I was completely free of my addictions. I looked different. People were stunned. They didn't know what to make of it. There was a lot of people that said, I don't want to be around her. That scares me. Um, they would call me and ask me what happened, but nobody could believe it because nobody believed that could really happen, but they knew me, so they knew something had happened. Nobody really knew what to do with this. My old friends were very freaked out. Most of them didn't want me around at all, which was very painful, but it was also a blessing. All of who I hung out with were in the bars all the time. My new obsession was to find the one that had healed me, the one that gave me that amazing peace in my head because I had never had peace in my entire life. I have never mattered to anyone like I must have mattered to him that day because I wasn't even worth it. I was a, I was a disgusting human being, but I have pursued Jesus ever since that day more than anything else. He is all I want. And we all, for the people who continually come to me that they can't get free, can't get free, I tell them, we have pursued the world. We have chased down men. We have chased down drugs. We have chased down alcohol. We will go to great lengths to get what we want. When you go after Jesus with that same fervency, you will get everything he has for you. And that's what I have done. I am more than I'm terrified of going to hell. I am enamored with Jesus Christ. I am completely in awe of him. The result was amazing. I went to every Bible study I could find for years, and I think that also is different from a lot of people want this quick fix. They want us to pray for them, get them free. They don't want to have to really invest too much in this. Me, I was calling people. Where's the Bible study? I want to go to a Bible study. I wanted someone to read me the Bible and tell me what it said. That's why I appreciate our pastors, Vito and Eugenia, because they read the Bible and they tell you what it means. And I appreciate that because that's how I learned. That's how I grew was in Bible studies where it was older women who would just read the Bible and then say what it meant verse by verse by verse. I was in church every time the door was open. In fact, when I went to court because I'd been arrested, the judge told me he was not going to send me to what was absolute mandatory treatment. Because of my fixation with church, he said, if you keep going to church, I don't want to interfere with that. I don't want to mix you up. Because they knew how bad off I was. And they could see the police report from that night. He said, I don't want to confuse you with mixing AA and, and faith. He said, but if you stop going to church, you will end up back here and then I will send you to treatment. I never ended up back there. I still marvel that I feel the same excitement about that day now as I did then. And my lowest day and my highest day in my life were the same day, probably within the same hour. For those who think there is no fixing this, mine High and low points were so close together, it's kind of hard to tell where one stops and the other starts. Needless to say, my mind races. It still races. My mind runs very fast. Now it's a gift. I tell people all the things that most people think, oh, that she's crazy. But to me, I can run circles around most people because I have learned to use what the world would call um, all these different diagnoses, I'm not even gonna say them. I have learned to see them as gifts. I can do amazing things as a result of having them and I feel like I was gifted beyond, I am a 10 talent person by design because what God gave me as gifts probably turned around and tore me up until God set them in right order. And most people know I just keep going and going and going. And I know it's because of the amazing gifts that God has given me in how I think that the world would say, you need medication for that. That's a mental illness. It is not a mental illness. It is an amazing gift from God. And I have learned 
to train them to be used for the kingdom and I wouldn't give them up for anything. If you want to heal your mind, get out your Bible and a notebook and start writing out of the Bible. It's that simple. I didn't have anybody telling me what to do. My mind was a crazy mess, but I just started writing out of the Bible in a notebook. Psalms was probably where I started because I remember Psalm 19, 119. I still give that to people to do when they tell me they're going to go commit suicide. I tell them, you write out Psalm 119 for me and then you can go and then they never do because it's the longest book in the Bible, but it also has a way of bringing um, some kind of order back to their mind. My second favorite book is 2 Samuel 22, but if you want your mind healed, you get a notebook, get a Bible, and start copying out of the Bible because that will heal your mind. That was my solution to every turmoil and every problem that I had writing out of the Bible. Fortunately for me, I was advised and found out early the best way to beat depression, anxiety, and fear is to serve others. And I never had to look far to find others that needed someone. I would just go sit at a park with them, um, simple places where if it wasn't nice out, we'd sit in a mall um, listening. Nobody cares, it's worse now. People just need someone to talk to. That's what I did. You don't need to be brilliant to do that. I worked full time, yet decided to find volunteer activities to do instead of sitting at home and watching TV. TV is one of the worst robberies of kingdom work of anything I know. The television is probably the worst addiction you could have if you are a believer. It will steal you from your calling. It's either TV or your calling. And I did not want to fall into being a television addict because I had seen a truckload of them in the church that don't do anything because they had this certain show that was on, or I can't that night because of this show, or I can't here because of this show. And I thought, oh, I was dying. I was out there dying and people couldn't help me because of what was on TV. They couldn't leave it. I never want to be that person. I would spend two nights a week at Youth for Christ with kids who really needed attention. And I also worked one day a weekend at the treatment center, volunteering in the bookstore or doing crafts in the treatment center, which is where I met Tatiana, but I didn't know that till this year. But that's where I was so that I didn't sit home and watch TV or sit home and let my mind rage. I, I served. None of these activities required me to be smart or trained in anything. They required me to show up. That's it. I had to show up and be kind and look for the one that was hurting. I loved every minute of these times and I never fell back into depression as a result. And I will say that my depression was so severe and had been such a regular part of my life my entire life that I was suicidal from being a young teenager all the way up till that point. I had spent most of my life being suicidal, many times even going outside and running around the house just to not commit suicide. Knowing Jesus and serving others is the combination that still keeps my life amazing, worth living, and in my opinion, I could not imagine a better way to spend my life. Serving others is what I love to do, nothing complicated. After eight years of sobriety and volunteering, I wanted more. I could not handle this mediocre life, complacency. I did not want that. Again, I didn't want to be the one who sat on a pew in a church and listened on Sundays and then went out and just did normal life. I, I was not that person. I gave it all to the devil. I could not sit and just be normal like other people around me were being. I couldn't do it. I thought, oh, I can't be this kind of a Christian. I wanted to be with the broken, like myself, the ones that were dying that no one cared about. So I wrote a letter to a ministry in Minneapolis who helped people in deep addiction in 1998, offering to volunteer on weekends doing janitorial work. They called me for an interview in 1999 and res this resulted in an offer to be a staff at the teen girls program. I had left that interview knowing there's no chance I'm gonna go up there, it's the hood, it's filthy, I'm not doing it. 
Back then, things were much smaller in this ministry. It was completely ghetto. And I decided there's no way I can work or live in such conditions. And then I go home and I realize that while I was in addiction, using drugs, drinking, living for myself, I lived in far worse conditions than that. And I was totally okay with it. So I became very um, disturbed by my own entitlement, my own um, needing convenience, needing comfort, not being willing to go outside of this somewhat decent life I had made for myself. I was disgusted. I was completely disgusted with myself. I would serve Jesus if it was nice, clean, and pretty, but I wasn't willing to go back to anything close to what I had come from to rescue others. I felt I had somehow earned a better ministry than that. So I vowed to God that night because I was so disgusted with myself that if this ministry called me, I was going to accept. Well, they called, I accepted, and I shut down my normal comfortable life to move to Minneapolis in 1999 and worked with teen girls for a year. Hardest thing I've ever done. I don't have my own children. I don't know how people do it with teen girls. I don't know how they do it, but it was the greatest lesson of my life. It taught me that my choice was to be to love no matter what they said or did to me. I don't care how angry I felt on the inside, I had to choose to love them because they needed that. And I could see myself in them and I thought, I've just got to keep loving them. I wasn't around men too much at that time, but when they did, I really didn't have anything favorable to say to them. I had a great aversion to men at that time. One day, one of the men's staff in this ministry confronted me saying, God could really use you if you would get over that anger. We can see it on you. And I was angry he said that to me. Later that week, um, the director of the Brooklyn, New York Teen Challenge, Pastor Jimmy Jack, he came to our ministry to speak. He walks up to me at an altar where I'm with the girls, and he asked me if I knew what a worm looked like. And I told him I did. And then he asked me if I knew what a snake looked like. And, he, and I said yes. And he said a worm is just going to lay there. You can cut it in pieces. You can do all kinds of things to it. It's not going to move too much. A snake he said, you mess with a snake, it's going to strike. He said, you're a snake. You have a soul wound that needs healing and you need to shut your mouth. Either you keep choosing to be your own defender, your own protector, your own justifier, and your own vindicator, or you need to allow God to do all of those things. But if you choose God to do all of those things for you, then you need to shut your mouth. And from now on, your only choice of words when someone says something to you that upsets you, offends you, or makes you angry is, God bless you. He said, that's it. That's your only choice of words. Because he caught me so off guard, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God had spoke to me because this man did not know me from anywhere. And it was a defining and very pivotal moment in my life. And it has come around even now to where it has become a pivotal thing again in my life. But I realized at that time that I was sinning to hold on to that anger, no matter how deserving I felt for it. And I still consider Pastor Jimmy Jack to be the one who God used to break through all of my emotional sin. What would have cost me my destiny was that offense. God severed it right there. I immediately went to my boss and I said, I want prayer ministry, whatever that is. I knew the clients were getting it. I just didn't know where it was for me. And she sent me to someone and I have never stopped going since. I get prayer ministry every year. Um, now we do it, it works for even myself. I get touched many times when we're praying with other people. I now am pretty humble about when something's not right, I don't wanna keep it because it's going to keep me from bringing Jesus to someone else and I know that. I want my mouth to be surrendered to Jesus. I want him to be my protector, not me. And shortly after gaining victor victory in this critical area, the director of the ministry approached me about serving in the jails and prisons of Minnesota for the ministry and I, as 
terrified as I was of that, I really, I'm, I'm a passionate evangelist and I really wanted to go into the jails and share Jesus. But I decided I had to step over my fear, which I did. And I remember my brother's pastor told me once, God does not use pew warmers. He moves around those who are moving around for him. He can move you if you go to the wrong place. He can move you. But if you're sitting on a pew and you're not moving, he's not going to, he's going to bypass you. I wanted to be a moving target. So I went out into the jails. I ended up being in about 35 jails a month sharing with adult inmates daily for nearly 10 years. Most of them men. I received my healing from um, just my rage and my fear and my over men from men. It was men who brought me my healing, not professionals. God used those who had committed the same offense to speak healing to my life, totally changed my life. And I can tell you stories for days of how the, the impact on my life of many that I met who were incarcerated, who probably would not be getting out for years. They changed my life. I saw many who I recognized them as being husbands, fathers, sons, daughters, mothers, sisters, and I saw the value in them because I had once been the one everyone looked at and turned their head. I saw them and God in turn made my life incredibly rich. I saw hundreds come to Christ and it was the best time of my life. I'm in touch with many of them still today. In November of 2008, I hit black ice on the freeway and had a massive, ended up in a multi-car pileup, almost hit a semi. Um, I ended up with some pretty serious um, mental issues from that accident, more so than physical, and I was not able to drive for a while. I was, my hands would sweat too bad to even drive, so I felt like I had been shelved. I felt like this thing, this ministry that I love so much, I can't do it now because I can't drive. And it was a very hard time for me. I'd also tested positive for tuberculosis. I had gotten that in the jails and I was on nine months of a very strong medication that made me very sick. And at the same time, my husband was in recovery from stage four cancer and it was just a really hard season for me. And I wondered how I would ever find anything again as great as being in the jails. And I thought, well, maybe he wants me to go to school and learn something because people kept telling me, you need to go to school, you need to get a degree, you need to this. Kept thinking I needed to be educated. And I thought, well, maybe that's what he's doing. He's boxing my life in, so I have to go to school. But in the midst of that, I was approached by my next boss in December of 2009, and he asked me if I would be willing to accept a position as director over the women and girls because they needed their heads lifted, he said. He said, you're a lifter of heads. I want you to go and lift their heads. I had no idea how to do that job, but I thought I will, I will go in and sure try. It is not about the diploma I did not have, the, any kind of degrees I did not have. One thing is consistent with my life, and that is he must increase, I must decrease. That's what I know. I have no education for anything I do. I have a high school diploma. Once again, I threw fear to the wind and jumped into a job far bigger than myself. And I learned to love women, which was not easy either for me. Watching a life being transformed keeps me speechless. And I marvel at God giving me such a great seat in what is going on in the earth from his hand and many of the women I'm very close to now is, are women I came to love dearly. I hope to have them in my life until eternity and then for eternity. I want to return back and speak to a couple of very important things. Um, my personal life, after being born again, I had come from a lifestyle of immorality, sexual immorality. Dating turned out to be as messy after being born again as before. I was so excited about Jesus, so excited about life. I had gone from death to life, literally. I went from a person that people wondered if I even had life to somebody who's just vibrating with excitement over Jesus. That excitement I have found draws people to me and not always in a good way. 
And what this did was it pulled people into my circle, men, who were just like invigorated by the excitement. They didn't even necessarily appreciate the Jesus talk, but they enjoyed the vibrancy that I had. I was told later. This would result in very toxic connections that created the same possessiveness, jealousy, and boundary issues that I had when I was living in sin. And God showed me at that time, after a few times when I thought, I'm going to get assaulted again, that if I really saw my relationship as born again, as being the marriage that Jesus said it was, I did not need these guys. I did not need them in my life. None of them. I did not need them. And at that point, I chose to really value my covenant with Jesus as a marriage. I was going to learn what that meant like meant to be. And I fasted from dating for nearly five years because I wanted to shatter that dependency on needing affirmation in my life. And I was going to do it at all cost. So I just completely just, I wouldn't even go out for coffee. I wanted nothing to do with that. I was so sick of who I was in that way and it was a hard choice but after i made the choice it was so worth it i have no regrets i abandoned myself to searching and serving jesus and it was one of the best seasons of my life because i was very focused on jesus and i never i i just every opportunity i maximized and it was amazing i met my husband in 2005 we got married 15 months later in 2006 because the thing that drew me to him was his love for the broken, but also his honor of me. I had not been around men that were interested in waiting for anything. And he was interested in being a protector, a friend, a listener, and a helper. And I wasn't used to that. So it, I even had a hard time thinking this is dating because I wasn't used to that. I was used to a whole different mentality from men where they're pursuing something for themselves. And I did not know a different kind of guy. I had not been around that. So it was hard for me to understand this as just a friendship, but I've never met anyone like him. And I was 42 when I married the first time. I had never even lived with a man before. I'd never had children, not because I was moral, but because I was angry and I hated men. That's why I didn't. Kevin had become the best friend I could ever want. I trusted him completely. I still trust him completely. I still feel if somebody called me and said that he did something, I would laugh because he is so trustworthy. And I am so trustworthy with him. I would never do anything to hurt him. I never imagined myself married, but I can't imagine myself not married to Kevin. He's been amazing. I've learned that being a lover of Jesus Christ does not equal having no trouble in the world. It's actually the opposite in many ways. Life can be very painful. Eight months after I was married, Kevin was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And to those who know cancer language or don't, it's an incurable diagnosis. And I remember the call he got that day where he said, what are my chances to the doctor? And I had no idea. He had been given a PET scan. He didn't tell me because he didn't want it to be true and he didn't want to scare me. But when he said that, what are my chances? I immediately knew, so I knew what was going on and I felt my heart completely stop. I felt like I was in a tunnel. I have no way to really describe what I felt like I could just hear a tunnel, but it was a defining moment in my life and I knew everything had changed. I knew the rest of my life was changing right there. And somehow it felt like a hand came underneath me right then because I don't even know what I would, would have done. It came under both of us. We transferred his medical care immediately to Mayo Clinic. They confirmed the diagnoses, but they took two extra weeks to do scans and tests to make sure they knew where all of the cancer was before they operated because of how serious it was. So we spent the better part of that two weeks staying at Mayo Clinic and strangely, we just had a vacation. We did fun things. We went places down there and walked around and did fun things because we knew we weren't going to be doing that for a long time. And part of their requirement at that time was having him get his affairs in order 
in event that he did not survive the surgery because it was very serious. And we signed all the paperwork that wrapped up his life. And I remember him push, just passing his job off to someone else to do. He had a very big job. But we laughed and we did fun things and we really had a great two weeks. It, it just is hard to believe that we did that. But I've learned now that there's a huge difference going through something with Jesus than without him. He comes so close to you. And it's very clear when I look back that he really stayed present the next eight or nine months were terrible for Kevin. He lost 60 pounds. He couldn't walk. He rarely stood up for four months. He couldn't speak because the surgery was to his head and his neck. And I had to do all the communicating for him because he couldn't talk. He didn't have the energy to do anything. He was very medicated in a chair for months. It was very painful to watch, but I learned how to become a wife and a protector. And I learned to live every single day, one hour at a time. I couldn't look ahead one day and God gave me strength, hope and grace for that day. Not more that day, sometimes one hour at a time. A few times I really was coming apart and I would call someone who had been through something similar and they would just tell me, keep going just keep going keep going they never told me how much worse it was going to get they said because they knew you couldn't hear that then but just keep going that's what i tell people in any situation keep going don't stop here keep going i learned that agreement and prayer and confessing life over my husband were powerful and i learned that god is able to do what doctors only hope can happen and i cut out everyone who who gave a different report. Everyone who went, <gasps> I was done. I could not be around that. So if people came alongside and said, we can come sit with you, we can come read the Bible to you, we can come pray with you, I was all about that. But if anybody came and wanted to talk about how serious this was, I didn't want to see them. I still don't want to see them. I already knew that. I didn't need anyone confirming it. Today, Kevin is free of cancer, and he's in better shape than he was before that diagnosis. It changed us in every way. It totally changed our marriage, set us up actually, since we were barely married. But I tell people, what would you fight about if you actually watched your husband almost die? What do you fight about after that? Everything takes perspective at that point, and there's no reason for me to challenge him and to argue and fight with him, because it's a miracle that I'm even living with him still. I tell you this so you know that I have another entirely miraculous chapter of my life besides being delivered from all of my sin. And me, many people do get that call where they are told that news and it sucks the breath right out of them. I totally get it. And I am here to offer hope because we are on the other side of that by 12 or 13 years. It's given me yet another reason to shout the name of Jesus from the rooftops. After 20 years of serving this other ministry, God asked me to leave comfort and security because he wanted me to be a voice and a servant for him out in a troubled field where women didn't have the, they needed someone to help them walk through the hard things when they left treatment and went back to their life. It was just too hard. And I knew those struggles. He told me that I had a new team and a mission and he wanted me to proclaim the gospel and use the authority that Jesus paid for with his blood to free people trapped by the demonic either oppression or possession. He wanted me to leave organized, tidy work to come out and fight the enemy for those who couldn't fight him themselves. And he would teach me that because I barely knew what that meant at the time. 
The one thing I did know that he was close, very careful to tell me about was that I had to stop defending my reputation, defending myself, protecting myself from accusations because he took me back to the time when Pastor Jimmy Jack gave me a very firm lesson and he said either you do it or I will do it, but it doesn't go both ways. God knew what I didn't know, that there were gonna be many battles on this side, many accusations, many things said, but I had made a commitment to him. I'm gonna come out here and I'm gonna do what you've called me to do because I can't even live with myself if I say no. But I'm very grateful that I had someone who had already taught me the clarity of that, trusting God to be my defender, my vindicator, because I have been able to walk past all of those things, knowing that God will protect me, he will defend me, and in the end, he will vindicate me. I know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I don't even struggle with that. It's not easy but it's the best thing that was ever said to me. And I'm so grateful to Pastor Jimmy for saying those words to me early on because it's been more critical to me at this time of my life than it was back then. And I am changed again because of that word. I'm learning what it means in a whole new way because I've never had to depend on God like I do now to just let the voices go let the accusations fly, let the things be said. I do trust God to protect me and vindicate me. He has been amazing. Meanwhile, he sends us these incredible pastors, Vito and Eugenia, and they teach us a whole new way to do ministry. Use the word. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Just open your Bible and do what it says. So they spend over a year teaching us how to confront the enemy in people's lives and throw him out on their behalf for people who aren't able to do it for themselves. We have an amazing example now leading us in the direction we were to go. And I am so grateful for their, their example and how simple they have kept it just do what the word says. That's all. And all is a lot. I wouldn't trade the world for the privilege I have of walking so closely to Jesus. Time is so short. I wouldn't want anything. I wouldn't want the whole world at my disposal if it meant that I had to give up Jesus for five minutes. Isaiah 43, one through three says, fear not. For I have redeemed you, I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. To have narrowly escaped death and hell on February 16, 1991 has radically impacted my life and my choices to this very day. I have an imprint on me of hell. He allowed that. I don't want anyone going there. No one that I meet. And I can endure a lot of pain and rejection from others because I cannot bear the thought of hurting or saying no to Jesus, the one who gave everything for me. Nothing is worth that to me. No title, no salary, nothing. I do not need the applause of man. I don't need any of it. I want to please Jesus. I meet many who nearly die. They tell me all the time, I've been Narcan six times and I think, how are you not passionately chasing Jesus? But they don't give it much of a thought. They don't realize how blessed they are like I do, that God does not owe us one more chance. He doesn't owe any of us anything past the cross. If you're waiting until the end of your life or for even tomorrow to be saved and to surrender to Jesus, that choice is not up to you. It's up to him. It's not up to you. And most who wait one more day, one more day, one more day, aren't granted the opportunity 
and by default of waiting because they, they love their sin, they love having control of their own life and they love the world, hell will be their eternal destiny. And I'm so thankful to God for sparing me that eternity by my constantly shutting him out for one more, one more, one more, one more something that he chose to save me and heal my mind from constant torment that caused me to consume lethal amounts of chemicals is beyond me to this day. Anybody who knew me would have said that's the last one I would have picked if I were God. Anybody, including me. I simply was not worth saving. There is no question in my mind I was not worth saving. There was nothing left of me mentally, physically, or spiritually except insanity and absolute wreckage. So I praise him every single day of my life. He has given me 31 years now of marvelous peace. I have not relapsed. If people do relapse, get back up. That's not even a marker, but I have not. God gave me an allergy to alcohol. I smell it a mile away. I cannot drink again. I can't even take communion that's alcohol because I have to spit it out. I'm very allergic. He secured me from alcoholism. I wouldn't want to experience five minutes without knowing that Jesus is faithfully in charge of my every movement. I cling to the safety that he has promised me from now until I get to see him face to face, which will be soon. I believe it. And knowing that the God who created the universe is my personal champion in life has changed every single thing about what I do, the choices I make, and very few people understand me because they don't have the relationship with him that I do. I won't trade it for anything. I do not fear any longer anything greater than losing that. And I look forward to each day knowing that he's already ordered things for me to experience that make me excited and fulfilled. He has never failed me yet. So today to Jesus, I give all the honor, all the glory, and all the gratitude that I can for being the greatest and most awesome redeemer to me that he is. Precious Lord, I cannot even begin to thank you for not just saving me from hell, but saving me from going back to mediocrity, for taking the cross of Jesus Christ for granted and living life on my terms. That is the worst thing that could happen to me, is to direct my own plans and visions in ministry. That would be the worst thing. There are so many things that I have seen that I would be so afraid of falling into. I just want to follow you, Jesus. As confusing as that can be at times, it is so amazing to do that, to watch what unfolds from one day to the next that's not written in a plan. I have no idea what will happen, but it's incredibly exciting to walk with Jesus. I pray for everyone within the sound of my voice. I just curse the darkness. I curse the plan of the enemy. For those walking in pride who think somehow they're going to be fine when they did not follow Jesus, I ask that you would overwhelm them with the reality of what will happen if they do not surrender their plans to Jesus Christ. I ask for those who are dying in addiction, who do not feel they can get sober like me, I ask that you show up for them in a miraculous way and set them free in the name of Jesus, that you just destroy the power of the enemy over them and loose them in Jesus' name into the freedom to follow you, Jesus. I ask that the blood of Jesus Christ wash over every mind, every heart, and give everyone a moment of clarity of what it feels like to be forgiven, to be free from sin and self-rule, self-motive. Wash them, Jesus, and give them even five minutes of what that feels like to be all surrendered to Jesus Christ for your next step. I give my life completely to you. That's the only place I want it to be. And I ask that you do the supernatural in our midst. 
with the Kashubans, with me, with Tati and Shaylee, I ask that you just burst out in the supernatural, that we see revival come, that your kingdom will come to earth in power. God, we want to see you move and heal and restore and set free. Let it be us, Jesus. I ask this all in your precious name. Amen.